Hey everyone, welcome back. Together we are Thursdays. Um, this week we're talking about relapse and how to handle it. And also um, our dream vacation, our dream holiday. Um, relapse, tough subject. Um, as usual, much has been said earlier in the week. Um, Michelle talked about it is essential to acknowledge what's going on and to reach out and um, Crimson Butterfly also talked about um, remembering your reasons and not allowing yourself to talk yourself into a full relapse. Um, but what I want to say, and Crimson mentioned this too, and you guys have probably, if you follow my videos, have heard me say it a million times. Recovery is not a linear journey, ever, okay? Forward steps and backward steps are both part of the choreography of this crazy ass dance we all are doing. And tools along the way is one thing. I guess my main focus on this is, you guys already know, like, we have several videos, like, recovery toolbox and, you know, repertoire and whatever else we've titled things like tools for recovery and talked about what's helped us or um, commented on different therapies etc I want to focus on the psychology of relapse and how the psyche perpetuates it at times and it can be as the girls have said, like, one slip, right, like, one lapse becomes this perpetual excuse to completely immerse or to completely relapse. Um, personally, in my experience and in my research knowledge, um, it is very difficult when you are in that mindset to pull yourself out. Um, others, other girls were talking about um, stressors, recognizing stressors. If you are feeling deeply triggered, try to evaluate why. But I think the number one thing is be gentle with yourself. Um, it's not easy. It can be frustrating as hell. It can be frightening. It can feel like a reversal of all your progress. Again, we tend to think in these black and white absolutes, and it's not true. If you regress, it doesn't mean you're all the way back at ground zero and you have to start this journey over again. It doesn't work that way. Um, there is no unknowing experience. There is no um, undoing incidences where you have conquered the thoughts. And just remember that, that if you are in a very dark place and you can't find your way out, hang in there. Um, if you can make yourself do it, and this is the thing, if you can make yourself do it, review old um, things that helped you, reasons to recover, tools that work, music, getting out of the house, um, calling somebody say that's your special go-to person 24-7, whatever talk to your therapist, whatever works for you, but if you are, it is so easy to talk about what to do in a relapse when you're not in a relapse, because once you cross that line, there are whole new rules of how people think and act and make decisions, and it's, it's not necessarily that easy. So, what I recommend is be with what's going on, try to let your thoughts and emotions come, be with those feelings rather than trying to suppress them or resist them or um, even if you're just kind of feeling indifferent or apathetic toward recovery and you um, might 
it, it can feel like a relief to just let go and kind of justify it. That is the battle that one must learn to manage and may have periods of remission where thoughts die down to a barely a whisper in the back of your head and you're able to override it and follow your meal plan exactly and get through those patches. Um, so I think in working your way back from a setback then, the number one most critical thing is give yourself credit for your successes and realize that a back step, number one, is not a failure and number two does not erase all of your progress at that point. Start focusing on tiny, infinitesimal, if need be, steps back up. And um, this is something we all need more practice at, is acknowledging our accomplishments, being gentle with ourselves. Um, these things happen. And sometimes it might take a close friend to say, hey, you're really, you really seem like you're regressed. You know, do you want to talk? You know, in that moment, like we live in the now, I'm always saying, in that moment where you're re-immersed, it's like, how do I explain this? Okay. It is really common for sufferers to talk about Regardless of which side of that thin red line you are on between overeating pathology and health, I'm trying to find balance on that line, but depending on which side you're on, the other side takes on this dreamlike recollection quality. The healthy mind, the rational, logical, sane, non pathological thought process. is diametrically opposed to that of the ED. So we tend to synthesize the experience as a vague thing in the past or surreal like a dream. It doesn't feel real, if you know what I mean. So it's so difficult. It is very easy if you are in a stable place to say what you should do during a relapse, but just know that sometimes you can't pull yourself out right away. And that's just part of the journey. It doesn't mean you're doomed, it doesn't mean you're a failure, and it certainly doesn't mean that you are any worse off than, or in any way taking a back step in your own journey. Um, it's in no way a failure. Um, that's really important to remember. And um, hopefully you have cultivated enough connections now that if you regress, even if you say nothing, even if nobody's around to see your behaviors, the very fact that you begin to isolate again, maybe start avoiding talking or avoiding people, engaging in symptoms, somebody's going to notice. Um, and hopefully that person can challenge the ED voice and say, hey, um, there's a lot of reasons why you've been fighting this and it's time to get back on the fight. Um, it doesn't always work, but that's why it's so important to have a solid support network. Sometimes you can't pull yourself out. And it does take somebody else to stand up to that voice and be like, No, this is not going to go on. I won't tolerate it. We are stronger together. And we can help each other in that way. Big time. Um, yeah, so I guess just be gentle with yourself and realize that setbacks are not failures, nor do they negate progress made. They happen. Um, it's kind of par for the course with the pathology. Um, it is very typical for individuals who have gone through a significant period of time with an eating disorder to recover, or, um, I tend to think of it as, like, remission versus activation more. I just, personally, um, don't think there's a cure. I think one must learn to manage and may have periods of remission where thoughts 
die down to a barely a whisper in the back of your head and you're able to override it and follow your meal plan exactly and get through those patches. I mean, what helps mama? Hmm? Who helps mama? My tilty headed Eileen helps mama. Yes, you do, cutie pie. You help me all the time. Eileen says, I know when you don't feel good. I can whine and tilt my head and be cute. Yes, you're so cute, baby. You're so cute. They know. They totally know. If you don't have a pet and you. I can't even imagine why you wouldn't. But that's just me. They are so. You know, some people have. Um, service dogs for sensing seizures or low blood sugars or are disabled and the dog helps them physically. You know what? If you look up. Dang it, what is It's a study from the Netherlands with puppies that they, little Sheltie dogs, I think it was, um, puppies that were given to um, eating disorder sufferers that helped them because animals are so in tune with body language. They know when you're not well. And their behavior and their reaction can be an important cue to how you're doing and often can warn you very much earlier on than you or somebody else might perceive. So therapy animal might be a really good option to stay strong. They are immensely beneficial, sentient, empathic, warm, soft, unconditionally loving, awesome support. Um, but yeah, depending on which side of the line you're on, the other side is going to feel like a mist-covered netherworld of vague recollection. And this is the dilemma. When you're sick, you can't fathom being free of the bad thoughts. You can't fathom breaking the rituals and surviving. Um, when you're healthy, especially after a bad time sick, it doesn't feel real. It feels like it was a dream or in another lifetime that you were sick. It's part of the way the mind protects us. Um, so it's really important to recognize that as well, that depending on which side you're on, your perspective is completely different. So yeah, in a stable place, it's really easy to say what you should do, but um, it's a lot more difficult in reality. And I just want to mention that because I don't want to give viewers the false sense that you should just know, and you should just know better, and you should just be able to rely on. It's not an easy thing at all. Not that anybody was implying that at all, I just wanted to voice that thought that it is normal and to be expected that these things are difficult. I'm always talking about Stephen Levenkron, he's like the father of modern anorexia treatment, he's written a ton of books. Um, he has very clearly articulated this um, tendency for people to spend a great deal of time in stable recovery and then at some other phase of life they may have a relapse. The most common seems to be sufferers who were young children, um, teenagers or young adults recover, be stable, and then some midlife event, um, or prior to that, especially in women, getting pregnant can trigger relapse because body changes bring back a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it happens. It doesn't mean that you're bad or that you're doing something wrong or that you haven't done enough. I mean, all of these thoughts are going to take a long time to deconstruct, um, but that it can be done. Compassion for self. One of the things that helps a lot with that when you're trying to think about how do I be nice to myself or give myself 
any kind of recognition for good things. Do an empathic exercise. How would you respond to somebody you love in the same situation? Like, say you um, found yourself skipping meals and felt the euphoria of restriction again and really didn't want to get back on the journey to healing um, in a proactive manner. Would, if this was your best friend or your significant other or somebody you dearly love, and it happened to them, would you be thinking of them as a failure and a loser and a weakling and not good enough? Absolutely not. You'd respond with compassion and you'd know this isn't their fault. I love and support them. You know, it's not a failure. Just remember that too. Okay, too many babblies. My dream vacation would be to go to the Galapagos Islands. I would love to see the Darwinian finches, um, which helped him come up with his theory of evolution. Um, my stepmom has been. She loved it. Also, the marine life out there is incredible. Um, really cool stuff. And I'm like a big aviculturist, ornithology aficionado, I guess really passionate about um, marine life and conservation and stuff. So yeah, the Galapagos would just be absolutely mind-blowing to see. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it would be for me. What about you guys? If you're watching, let us know. I'd, I'd love to hear everybody else's concept of the perfect vacation. I can tell you Mr. Empaths would be to go to London. He wants to go to the UK so much. He is the ang most anglophilic anglophile ever. Um, yeah, so much love, be well, and as usual, if you have a comment or a question or a topic idea or anything, feel free to contact myself or anyone else on the team. We are here for you always. You are not alone. Much love and be well, precious ones. See you next week.